in continuation of our extended coverage of uh, the Ukraine crisis. We're now joined by journalist, activist, and political analyst John Bosnich, who's joining us from Belgrade. Also, we have spokesman at uh, the LaRouche organization, Harley Schlanger, joining us from Potsdam, Germany. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Uh, let's uh, uh, kick off this segment with Mr. Bosnich. John, there's so much happening over the past few hours. I honestly don't know where to start. How about you give us your perspective on uh, the European response, uh, the comments that we heard from top European officials uh, just about an hour ago uh, with regards to, uh, to events that are taking place right now in Ukraine? Well, first of all, all of these European responses were surely written days ago in anticipation of these events. So there's nothing new here. This is just the regurgitation of their previous stances on this issue. Uh, the fact of the matter is that NATO, uh, under the guidance of Washington, conducted an illegal coup d'etat in Ukraine over seven years ago, and Russia patiently and carefully and legally reviewed all of the options. There were referendums for separation in Crimea, and in the Donbass, those referenda were rejected by the government of uh, Ukraine in Kiev, and Russia recognized those regions, recognized their overwhelming referenda. These are not 51 percent. These are in the 80, 90 and above percentage point support for separation from Ukraine and return to Russia. And I say return because Crimea and Donbass are former historical heartlands of Russian territory that were transferred during communism against the then wishes of the United States in 1950s to the territory called the Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine. So. We've got the Western leaders talking out of both sides of their mouths. They uh, give you the other example, which, co uh, which contradicts their current stance. All of these Western leaders were in favor of the NATO incursions and bombings in Yugoslavia. These people are actual perpetrators of actions that they now accuse Russia of taking, except their actions were illegal and Russia's actions are in conformity with international law and the declarations of sovereignty of peoples. Harley Schlanger, uh, the uh, EU foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, uh, earlier stated that Russia faces unprecedented isolation over uh, what's taking place in Ukraine. Uh, an analyst that we spoke to earlier on the issue said that Russia is definitely prepared uh, for uh, for all of the uh, scenarios, what kind of a response do you expect to see from Moscow uh, regarding the stance that Europe has taken? Well, first of all, I want to say I agree with every, virtually everything that John said previously. And you have to look at what precipitated these actions. It was a long-term rejection from the West to address legitimate grievances and, and concerns brought up by Vladimir Putin about Russian security. The most recent threat was when Zelensky said that Ukraine is considering developing nuclear weapons. The idea that the West would place nuclear weapons on the border of Russia from the beginning was a security threat which Putin could not accept and the Russian people would not accept. Now, in, in response to this, what's Russia been doing? They have, on February 4th, there was a meeting between President Putin and President Xi Jinping of China, where they reached extensive agreements, not just military agreements, but especially on economic integration. The real cause of the freak out from the West is the emergence of a new potential economic system coming from Eurasia. And the idea that Moscow will be isolated is, is fraudulent. There, for example, here in Germany, you have business leaders who have been pleading with the government to reach an accommodation with Putin because of the importance of Russia as a trading partner with Germany. Cutting Russia off is going to do more damage to Germany and France than it will to Russia because Russia has wheat, they have oil, they have special strategic metals and minerals. They have relations with many, many nations in the Eurasian area which will enable them to make it through this. They also have very little foreign debt. Ukraine, on the other hand, 
has four to five billion dollars of debt coming due that they don't have the money to pay for and what are they doing they're borrowing another five billion dollars from western countries to buy weapons so the the russians are prepared and they're not prepared for war what putin said is this is a specific operation to secure the the safety and independence of the people living in the donbas region and instead of the shrill attacks from people like von der Leyen talking about the democratic people of Ukraine. The, the Ukrainian government has shut down opposition newspapers. It's done exactly what they accuse Russia of doing. So I think the problem is that the narrative in the media is controlled by people like von der Leyen and Burrell and uh, Tony Blinken and others who have been lying from the very beginning and minimally are guilty of gross hypocrisy. John Bosnich, uh, we're focusing on some of the reactions that are coming in uh, because this is a developing story. Uh, within the hour, we had uh, uh, comments from head of the German Foreign Affairs Committee describing the fresh gas contracts with Russia as inconceivable uh, at this point. Is that really, uh, in terms of, of uh, looking at this from uh, an energy perspective, is that really uh, the, uh, the trail? that Europe wanted to follow with regards to Russia? Well, this is, a, this is a very apt question because this is where this conflict in Ukraine is leading. The, the, the superficial aspect of the conflict is the return to Russia of the ethnic Russian areas of Ukraine, which is a natural result. And, and luckily it's being achieved with the minimum of bloodshed. Um, I, I think that the deeper issue here is that America, in its aggressive tendencies towards Russia, towards Iran, and towards China, has pushed the world towards a great conflict. And Germany knows from experience that if there is a conflict between the West, they are the and the Germans are now going to review not just the economic factors, but the political factors. And I would say that we may be seeing a tectonic sh in the power on this planet, that the countries to the east of Europe will now have a fair and equal say in world affairs. They will have their independent economic structures. They will have their independent monetary system. And they will have political and cultural independence from what has been 75 years of Western pushing to the east, following what Hitler called Drang nach Osten, which means the drive to the east. It's high time the old Nazi policies ended and that NATO would be disbanded and that Germany should no longer be occupied by America and Japan also should no longer be militarily occupied by America. That is the big picture. Mr. Schengen, do you agree with uh, what Mr. Bosnich uh, is, is saying? We could be looking at uh, the, uh, the dawn of a new era. Well, I just gave a presentation at a Schiller Institute conference where I said we're now seeing the end of the unipolar era. The United States and the United Kingdom in particular still think that they can call the shots. And, and the reason they're doing that is not out of strength or goodness, but out of the fact that their system is collapsing. If you look at the world from the standpoint that John just reviewed, there's economic development in the East centered around the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, new agreements with uh, Iran, with Iraq, uh, in Africa, and with China and Russia at the forefront. Whereas the West is saying, no, we have to continue the imperial colonial policy with the developing sector. That's not acceptable to most countries anymore. What I think is important is that there be more voices heard in the West rejecting this unipolar system, which has brought misery to millions of people, the endless wars, the regime change coups. They talk about democracy and sovereignty even as they destroy democratic elections and, and overturn sovereign governments. Now, what we're calling for is the immediate convening of a new, of a conference to establish a new security architecture along the lines of what President Putin has proposed in which no nation can threaten the security of another nation. 
And I think this is really ultimately what we're looking at here is not a Ukraine crisis, although Ukraine is being used as a tool against Russia. And by the way, the Ukrainian people are being turned into cannon fodder, not by Russia, but by the West. But more importantly, this is the dawn of a new era. And the question is whether it can be achieved peacefully or will the West provoke a war which could lead to the extinction? Back to Mr. <clears throat> Bosnich. Uh, our guest in uh, Potsdam, Germany, uh, alluded a point that uh, maybe uh, the United States was trying to provoke uh, this sort of conflict, this sort of war. That's usually the trail uh, that uh, the United States and, and the likes of the United States, Washington, and London take is first it's the issue of containment. They were trying to contain uh, Russia. They're trying to contain uh, China. We've seen it with other countries. And then when that fails, starts the demonization process. Uh, we've been seeing uh, the mainstream media over the past week or so constantly stating that uh, Russia is going to invade Ukraine. There's going to be a war. Uh, they're trying to, uh, to put that narrative out there. But maybe in this case with Russia, uh, the likes of Washington and London have bit off more than they can chew. Well, uh, that's that's obvious here. And uh, I'd, I'd like to make a point that there's a reason why it's called the Anglo-American Empire. And that is because a great deal of the strategic planning for this kind of an imperial dominated world comes from England. And England managed over the years to somehow assert its authority and its worldview on America and uses America as its kind of henchman because America has so much power and so much military might. But we can trace this back to London and I think it's a very, uh, a very uh, important thing to note that the British Prime Minister wished luck to Ukraine yesterday and uh, he said he hopes that they can resist and those are the uh, perfect example of crocodile tears being shed by the lizard in London. That is all I can say. I don't expect any action from the West. I don't expect anything from the West whatsoever in as a result of this uh, very, very tactically and strategically perfect maneuver conducted by Russia, Russia to liberate its own ethnic kin from a regime that marched in lockstep just now in this era with militias wearing and carrying Nazi paraphernalia. That era is over. Russia is proving that no Russian will live under a Nazi dictatorship again. And Russia is proving that the law has an essence in justice. And justice is being brought to the ethnic Russians of Ukraine. What the rest of the U Ukrainians decide to do is up to them. But I would advise them not to poke the Russian bear. Harley Schlanger, are you back with us? Yes. All right. Uh, uh, I'm going to allow you to pick up uh, where we left off with your previous response. We lost you there for a second. And uh, also, uh, in retrospect, add, add to that as well. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, the European countries, the European Union, they could have acted in a better manner to de-escalate the situation uh, that we're seeing right now? Well, I think the point John made about London is very important because even with Brexit, the levers are being pulled by the British through the city of London, through the control of finances of the European Union, which they still have. And the European governments are functioning as adjuncts of this Anglo-American empire. Uh, the idea that Ursula von der Leyen or Josep Borrell or any of these people, Stoltenberg, have independent authority is a joke. They've been marching to this Anglo-American tune uh, ever since the European Union was established. Now, this is important because if you look back at the history, the reason Putin had to move was that there's a 30-year history of broken promises from the West that there would be no eastward expansion. And in the meantime, we've seen NATO move 600 kilometers closer, or actually 1,000 kilometers closer to the Russian border. And Putin said, we have nowhere else to go. And so this was something that was planned in advance from the West. 
It was a provocation going back to the 2014 coup, which was not a democratic revolution. It was a coup run by the Western neoconservatives, especially from London and Washington. So I think the, the Europeans are poorly served by the European Union. The idea of the EU is no nation can act as a sovereign power in its own interests, but must accept the dictates from, from Brussels. And those dictates are ordered from a, a banking cabal, a corporate conglomerate cabal, which is the same network that actually ran the first two world wars of the last century. And what were those about? Preventing a unity of Western Europe with Eurasia. That's British geopolitics. That was what represented the policy which led to two world wars in the last century. And it's that same kind of thinking which is putting us on the verge of that today. I think the point is that Russia is strong enough now, especially with the alliance with China, that the West is not so stupid as to risk a full-scale war. Although these kinds of wars happen by miscalculation and errors, and the question is, will we sleepwalk into a new war, or can we pull together an international conference which will address these real security interests that have been ignored for so many years by the transatlantic powers? Mr. Bosnich, um, there is, uh, according to many of the guests and many analysts that we've spoken to, specifically reactions online, that there's a major player uh, in this, specifically from this point on, and that's China. Where do you think China falls uh, in, into, uh, into this, uh, as a piece into this puzzle here? Well, the, uh, the Europeans and even Washington are late to the party. Uh, China already is a major global power, and China has been uh, purposely deprived of a voice in international affairs by the Eurocentric and the America-centric uh, world order, which is actually run from London. And now we're seeing a major, major change. I think that this is the, the end of the unipolar world, point one. It is the uh, exposure of the impotence of NATO and the EU, and it is the uh, grand premiere of China on the world stage, and we should be seeing that through the next three months as China becomes the critical partner in developing global peace together with Russia. Mr. Schlanger, do you agree with that statement? This could be China's grand premier on the global stage? Well, I think it's already happened. And I think that's what's driving the hysteria. I don't know if, if uh, people are aware of groups such as Chatham House and the uh, Atlantic Council, but these are think tanks that are British but also have American in influence in them. These are think tanks that have been lamenting the rise of China as though for China to have economic progress is a threat to the West. This is the same fear that drives them against Iran, that, that any nation which does not accept the surrender of its sovereignty to these Anglo-American forces is seen as a threat to the world order. Now, you, a nation as big as China, 1.4 billion people, uh, arguably the second largest economy in the world, uh, and situated as it is uh, strategically in Asia, uh, there's no way that the United States has a battle plan to contain China. But this is what the whole pivot to Asia is. Remember, it's only a few months ago that the U.S. ran out of Afghanistan with its tail between its legs, the U.S. and NATO. And what they were planning at that point was to use that to escalate a containment of China with the Quad Nations, the so-called pivot to Asia, and this has been thrown into uh, complete disarray by the emergence of this Russia-China alliance. So I, I do say that the unipolar order needs to be buried. We need a multipolar world based on recognizing the sovereign interests of every nation and all peoples on the planet. And this is something which the Anglo-Americans will never accept peacefully. Uh, I, that's why I'm afraid we're headed toward an extremely turbulent situation. 
Though, I, again, I, I think there are people in the military in the West that don't want to tangle with Russia or China. The idea of a war with China over Taiwan is a non-starter. So I, I think we are in a new era. The question is, do we have the intelligence in the West to adopt economic policies that will benefit the whole world as opposed to a small group of financiers in the city of London and Wall Street? Uh, Mr. Schlanger, I'm going to stay with you. <clears throat> this is a question uh, about, uh, about Europe and uh, focusing on the energy aspect. Um, how much is Europe losing in, in that regard uh, right now with the path that it's taking? It's losing tremendously. I mean, here in, in uh, Potsdam, we've seen our utility bills go up 40 percent for heating and, and uh, electricity, 40 percent since November. And it's going to go up more because the policy that's been adopted by the European Union is no coal, no nuclear. Not, now, the rest of the European Union, there's a split on this, but in Germany, no nuclear and now no oil and gas from Russia. Almost 40 percent of Europe's energy sources come from Russian gas and oil. To cut that off, what you're really doing is punishing the people of Europe, uh, not the Russians. The Russians aren't going to run out of oil and gas. And they're doing this for what purpose? To make sure that Europe stays under the thumb of NATO and the United States. You know, the old story, the saying was that the purpose of NATO is to keep the United States in Europe, Russia out, and Germany under. And that's what we're seeing again. Now, will the German people tolerate this? I'm beginning to see some signs in Germany with people speaking out the old Ostpolitik, Eastern politics of the Willy Brandt era, the idea that Russia is an important trading partner for Germany. But how long will Germany accept this subservience to the Anglo-American interests? That's one of the major issues. And the idea that there's unity in the European Union is, is completely false. There have been French people speaking out. Roland Dumas, the former foreign minister, who's been silent for years, came out the other day and admitted that the West promised uh, Gorbachev at the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union there would be no eastward expansion. There are many other political networks calling for, uh, for example, in France, calling for France to leave NATO, which is pretty much what de Gaulle did in the early 60s. So I think we're, we're seeing a breakup of this unity, which uh, Tony Blinken and Biden are proclaiming is the reason Russia is afraid. Mr. Bosnich, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, uh, our guest in, in Potsdam believes that uh, there is uh, clearly no unity uh, in, in the European Union right now. Well, I, 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 I agree completely with all the, all the words from my fellow commentator today. Um, these, these events have been predicted for some time. I had the pleasure of meeting the late Lyndon LaRouche in Washington when I worked in Washington in 2007. And I can tell you he was predicting these kinds of events at that time. The game is up. The Anglo control of America and of Europe is over. German people have the right to freedom and to not live in a U.S. militarily occupied country 77 years after the end of World War II. So the same thing goes for Japan. Japan is a militarily occupied American colony. And so I can say that if, if there are those out there who believe in lucky charms, this is 77, the luckiest year. 77 years since this order was established at the end of World War II. Let's hope that it's over this year, 2022. All right, for those of you just joining us, uh, we are um, covering the uh, latest developments with regards uh, to events unfolding uh, in Ukraine. The Ukraine president has now claimed uh, that the enemy has suffered serious loss, probably alluding to uh, Russian uh, forces. Uh, Mr. Bozich, is there uh, any light at the end of the tunnel to this? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I, 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 I take issue with the view that these are uh, bad events. These are inevitable events. When an event is inevitable, 
a rational, logical, well-educated person will come to grips with the inevitability of the fact that Russia and Ukraine will remain friends regardless of who the United States or who London puts in power in Kiev. These are blood relatives. These are the same people. They will find a peaceful uh, resolution of this issue among themselves. And we are extremely lucky to be living in the era, era of a statesman like Vladimir Putin, who could have seized the entirety of Ukraine by force today, in one day. He could have taken Kiev in just a day, and he did not, because he restrained himself to the letter of the law and to the principles of justice. This is the best cornerstone for a new, better, fairer, more equal world. And that's what we need. All right. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. Uh, I believe uh, we're now bringing in expert in Eurasian affairs, uh, Mr. Uh, Shoaib Bahman, if I'm correct. All right. Uh, we're trying to uh, add that guest to our panel. Uh, Mr. Harley Schlanger, what are your thoughts on uh, how this crisis could wrap up. Uh, I asked Mr. Bozic if there was any light at the end of the tunnel. How do you see this ending? Well, the problem is you have a psychological trauma going on in the leaders of the West <clears throat> because they are impotent. There's not much they can do. The sanctions won't stop the, uh, Putin. Putin already said no matter what Russia does, there'll be new sanctions. The, the sanctions regime has been in place for years, as it is in Iran, as it is now with the Caesar sanctions in Syria and against Afghanistan. So the West is limited as to what it can do, short of going to full-scale war, which makes no sense whatsoever. So the question now is, how long will it take before the psychological trauma of Western leaders can be pushed away and there can be an emergence in the West of figures who are trying to actually solve the problem. I watched with, with some interest Macron's trip to Moscow, uh, Olaf Scholz's trip to Moscow. Both of them were trying to avoid this, Macron for electoral purposes and Scholz because he's just come into to office and Germany is facing a lot of problems. You know, war is used very often as a way to distract people from the problems in their own country. And there are terrible problems afflicting the United States, the United Kingdom, France. There are people in the streets demonstrating against these governments every single day. So the question largely is up to the citizens of these countries. When will they tell the political leaders to stop it? And we, it took a long time to get out of Afghanistan, and it may have been an, uh, uh, an uncoordinated effort to get out, but it was the right thing to do. Is the United States really committed to send tens of thousands of troops to, to, to protect Latvia and Lithuania or Ukraine? No, I don't think so. So I think at some point they're going to have to bite the bullet and sit down and actually start a new round of negotiations. And what they'll probably do is say that now that Putin was unable to succeed in taking over all of Ukraine, which he doesn't intend to do, that Putin is now going to submit to negotiations. Well, that's the kind of fig leaf that they'll put up in the West. But I think uh, what, what John said is absolutely right. It's inevitable that this will end with a recognition in the West that the time where they can dictate the so-called rules of the rules-based order has ended. All right. Uh, first of all, we have some breaking news, as uh, this just in Ukrainian president has stated that uh, the country is breaking off diplomatic ties with Russia. We are going to, uh, to examine uh, the repercussions and ramifications of that also later on in the program. Allow me to thank my guests, Mr. John Bosnich from Belgrade and Harley Schlanger from Potsdam, Germany, for contributing to this segment of the program. We're going to continue with our uh, coverage on the events uh, unfolding in Ukraine with the expert in Eurasian affairs, Mr. Uh, Shoaib Bahman, joining us from the uh, Iranian capital, Tehran. Mr. Bahman, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, let's start off with a recent uh, uh, piece of news uh, that we just announced, Ukrainian President has officially announced a cutting off of diplomatic ties with Russia. What can you tell us 
about uh, the repercussions of that and also give us your perspective on how events have been unfolding with regards to Ukraine over the past few hours. The developments in recent hours show that the situation on the ground in Ukraine has entered a rather complicated stage and uh, if uh, measures are not adopted, are not adopted to put an end to the current situation, definitely that could lead to a larger scale war. Under such circumstances, the breaking up of diplomatic and political relations could itself serve as an impediment to the improvement of the situation and the de-escalation of the tensions. In fact, uh, cutting off any linking routes between the governments of Ukraine and Russia could result in and could actually fuel the current tensions and challenges. As a result, it would have been better that such a thing wouldn't have happened, and uh, it would have been better that uh, political consultations continued between the two sides. Mr. Obama, talking about fanning the uh, flames and exacerbating the current situation, we have to look at uh, the role that Europe has played uh, as of late. Many believe that uh, the Europeans could have taken a better direction uh, in trying to de-escalate the situation. How do you assess Europe's role uh, with regards to, uh, uh, to the uh, events uh, in Ukraine? The lack of unity uh, in the European Union has also played a big part in uh, uh, the accounts of many. Do you see it in that light as well? Well, once again, we are seeing the developments uh, similar to the ones which uh, unfolded in 2014. Those uh, developments are being repeated. If we return to those developments and events, we can understand that European countries, after that crisis came to an end, they uh, regarded themselves as the biggest losers, and even some European countries uh, believed that uh, they had been deceived by the United States because their uh, actually reduction of the level of um, economic ties with Russia or the, the escalation of tensions with Russia would be uh, actually w uh, w would be more harmful to the security and interests of the European countries than it were to those of the U.S. So, and at the moment, uh, it seems that after the de-escalation of the situation, it would be the Europeans which will be harmed more uh, by, these, by this situation. But the reality is that the Europeans so far have, uh, have not uh, adopted an independent policy with regards to even their own um, interests, national security interests. Uh, and with regards to the crisis, uh, instead of adopting an independent policy, they have been more mostly following uh, in the footsteps of the U.S. and they have followed Washington's policies in that regard. Of course, among European countries, there are serious differences of opinion in this regard. Some European countries like Britain, Poland, and uh, the countries uh, in, the bulk, in the Baltic Sea area, um, they go for an escalation of tensions with the U.S. and they are on board with the U.S. But some countries, like Greece and Italy, want a de-escalation of tensions and the amelioration of ties with Russia. And here, and the third group of countries, countries uh, including Germany and France, they have adopted more of a, of a mediator, of, 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 of the role of a mediator. So on the whole, the European countries lack a single and independent policy. If they had such an independent policy, instead of putting the pressure on Russia to end the crisis, naturally they would have put the pressure on the U.S. as well in order to see, to prevent the outbreak of war as we are witnessing today. 
Sure. The uh, uh, European uh, <laughs> officials, uh, specifically the foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, earlier in the day said that Russia faces unprecedented isolation uh, over uh, its actions in Ukraine. Is Russia prepared uh, for all inevitabilities, all scenarios? What kind of a response uh, uh, to this uh, so-called uh, heavy package of sanctions, unprecedented uh, package of sanctions that is being designed and drummed up against Russia. What kind of a response are you expecting to see? The reality is that the Russians, uh, uh, before they want to, they before they wanted to resort to military action, definitely they had uh, weighed the possible reaction by the West, by the Western countries, and most probably Russia did know that it would face. Uh, uh, very tough economic sanctions. Back in 2014, too, when Russia uh, was involved in the Ukraine crisis, the country faced the same kinds of sanctions, and Western countries tried to impose very tough sanctions against Russia, and especially on some economic and, and political officials of Russia. In 2014, the sanctions had uh, a rather considerable effect on the Russian economy. Before the Ukraine crisis, the rate of uh, the exchange rate between the ruble and the U.S. dollar was uh, almost, uh, there, were, there were also 40 rubles for the dollar. But after the sanctions were imposed, each, uh, uh, the exchange rate between the dollar was almost uh, between 80 to 90 rubles for each single dollar, so it showed that the sanctions uh, definitely de had devalued the uh, Russian currency. Ha Russia actually uh, has that crisis, has uh, seen that crisis, and after 2019, the Russians tried to increase its uh, gold reserves, and it looks like Russia has already predicted such a day in order to actually and they should have they knew that they would face such sanctions so under the current circumstances it shows that the russians are in a better situation when it comes to facing sanctions compared to the situation in 2014 and also uh, <clears throat> excuse me yes so we've been speaking to earlier uh, here on press tv stated that we're most likely seeing the dawn of a new era uh, in their own words the end of uh, a unipolar world as we know it, uh, uh, some even calling this uh, China's grand premiere on the world stage. Do you see it in that light as well? Yes, uh, if uh, we want to look at the issue in terms of the global stage, uh, the reality is that not only to today's crisis, but other crises which we have faced uh, uh, in the past decade around the world, all those crises have shown that the United States is no longer able to manage and control crises. If, for example, if we uh, take the Ukraine and uh, Russia crises, into consideration and compared those crises to the ones in the, the to the ones in 1990s and in 2000 if we compare those crises we will realize that in the crises which emerged in the 1990s and 2000 the americans were able to create crises and also they were able to uh, actually uh, take it to end those crises the way they wanted but the 2014 Ukraine crisis and followed by the Syria crisis showed that the U.S. actually has lost its hegemonic actually position in the world to a great extent. Today, countries such as Russia and China are regarded as serious rivals of the U.S. on the international stage. And uh, what is important is that these countries are actually are cooperating with one another 
against the policies of the U.S. Today, we are seeing uh, the uh, Russia and China's political support for one another against the U.S. We can clearly see that, and this can, in the future, uh, have a considerable effect on the on the change of the power makeup on this the international stage. We have to go back to uh, Europe constantly because we're getting a lot of uh, reactions uh, from. Uh, from the European Union at this point. Uh, when we look at all of this from uh, uh, an energy uh, perspective, from that vantage point, how much uh, is, uh, is Europe losing and suffering uh, from this path that it's taking right now? Well, uh, this is one of the pivotal issues in the Ukraine crisis. If you remember, the United States uh, in recent years, I mean, since the presidency of Trump, the U.S. has been making every effort in order to gain a foothold in Europe's energy market. And uh, the Americans, in order to uh, achieve this goal, they had but to uh, uh, set aside uh, actually uh, traditional producers uh, of oil and gas. Uh, they had, had to, they needed to set aside those producers from uh, Europe. Given that Russia was one of the main suppliers of uh, energy to Europe, uh, the Americans has uh, been uh, have been making every effort in order to prevent Russia's gas uh, energy exports to Europe. Even we saw that the U.S. Uh, uh, this uh, Nord Stream second uh, gas uh, pipeline uh, that they had been actually uh, actually uh, German and uh, French companies uh, had interests in that pipeline, but the U.S. even. Uh, sanctioned that pipeline in order to uh, actually fill the energy vacuum in the European market itself. So practically, uh, Germany st have, has stood up to uh, U.S. sanctions. It, we could have predicted that uh, the U.S. would uh, adopt new measures in this domain. At the moment, it seems that uh, Germany wants uh, uh, to wants a delay uh, in the uh, actually in the, the in the in the operation of Norm Norm Stream to pipeline. That means Europe has to provide part of its energy from another source, and this means that the Americans have uh, found the opportunity to play to actually gain a foothold in Europe's energy market of course it does it means that uh, you it means that Europe will become more dependent on the US in this regard and this is and one of the objectives of Washington in order to create the crisis in Ukraine was to uh, make uh, Europe dependent on itself in terms of security and energy. Indeed, uh, the head of uh, the German Foreign Affairs Committee earlier uh, described the fresh gas contracts with Russia as inconceivable. We were talking about a lack of unity amongst uh, EU, uh, EU countries. Is this definitely, in, in your opinion, is, is this uh, uh, the, uh, the path and the stance that all European countries want to take right now? The reality is that uh, 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 European countries and Russia also, it, it is the European countries and Russia all uh, which will be harmed the most because economic relations, the current economic relations between Russia and uh, European countries uh, are not comparable to economic relations between Russia and the U.S. That means even if today all economic ties between Russia and the U.S. are cut off, it will it will harm neither uh, Moscow nor 
Washington. But if uh, uh, re economic relations between Russia and European countries are strained, definitely both sides will suffer losses. This uh, uh, is important, especially in the energy domain because uh, around 32% of the natural gas used by Europe is provided by Russia. And any kind of sanctions that will be imposed on the gas industry and ga on, on gas exports, and uh, if Russia actually stops gas exports to Europe, it, it, it is not sanctions on Russia. It is, in fact, sanctions on Europe. In fact, Europeans would be imposing sanctions on themselves. As a result, in terms of economy, economically speaking, both Russians and both and Europeans, both of them will definitely suffer and suffer losses more than the U.S. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, that was uh, Mr. Shwai Bahman, expert in Eurasian affairs, joining us from the Iranian capital, Tehran. We appreciate uh, your comments. We're now bringing in uh, Ms. Afia Abedi, also an expert in Eurasian affairs. Uh, Ms. Abedi, welcome to the program. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, how events have transpired so far uh, over the past few hours uh, with regards uh, to Ukraine. And uh, uh, if you may uh, give us your perspective on some of the reactions that we're seeing right now, specifically the comments that we heard uh, earlier in the day from uh, top EU officials. As for reactions, well, uh, it seems that uh, Ukraine uh, I get, could you please repeat the question? Well, if you mean the uh, uh, Ukraine's reactions to the recent uh, developments, if that was your question, uh, I mean, the Russia's support for the independence of the eastern regions in Ukraine and the recent military operation, if that is your question, I should say that uh, anyway, uh, Europe uh, with regards to the developments in recent months, Europe has been trying to hold consultations with the other side. I mean, uh, U.S. and Russia. Well, in this case, uh, Russia and the U.S. were involved in a standoff with regards to Ukraine. Europe has been trying to settle the issue through dialogue. And uh, Europe w has been one of the victims of the developments in Ukraine, although Europe itself has had a key role in initiating the crisis in Ukraine. However, mm, be, uh, give, uh, given the tensions between Russia and the U.S., these tensions could threaten the security of Europe and uh, uh, on both military security and economic security of Europe. So Europe uh, has uh, uh, different European countries, especially France and Germany. We have seen that those countries have uh, adopted a lot of political uh, positions on that. If you ask me your questions in more detail, I will answer you properly. All right, Ms. Abedi, the first question was just giving you perspective, but of course the next questions will definitely go uh, into uh, more detail. The European uh, foreign policy chief this morning said that Russia will be facing unprecedented isolation over Ukraine. Uh, a guest that we spoke to said that uh, Russia will definitely be, pre be prepared for all outcomes, all inevitabilities. What kind of a response do you think we'll be seeing uh, from Moscow with regards uh, to the stance that Europe has taken at this point in time? Look, under such circumstances, you, uh, you, uh, we should uh, actually draw a line between political positions and practical positions. You see, because of the escalation of, uh, because of the escalation, you see, uh, well, actually, Russia sh should go for toleration, probably. And uh, we may face uh, sanctions on, uh, we may see sanctions on Russia, but the p 
positions that are actually adopted, I mean, practical actions which will be taken, I believe that uh, Europe will, in the midterm, uh, Europe will turn to go for dialogue and settlement of the crisis, and in the long run, will go for a new security pact between Russia and Europe, as uh, we have seen already in 2014, and before that, in 2008, we had we faced the same situation. The reason is that there are some complexities involved. That there is a kind of interdependence between Russia and Europe, so, and uh, and they are. Uh, it is undeniable because of the energy needs. Europe needs uh, Russia for energy, and uh, also. Uh, any movement, any military movement which takes place is in Eastern Europe uh, actually threatens the security, military and the economic security of Western Europe as well. Uh, on the whole, political positions with practical positions, uh, they, are, they are two different matters. Sure. Uh, is this, in your opinion, uh, as we've been speaking to many guests uh, who had the same opinion right now that we could be seeing the dawn of a new era and this is the end of, uh, uh, of the uni unipolar world as we see it and uh, the stage is set for China's grand premiere uh, on, on the world stage, most notably as being uh, a, a, a grand peacemaker on the world stage. Do you agree with that notion? Uh, uh, well, uh, when it comes to, well, on the international stage, I believe that since 2007 onward, uh, uh, changes have begun. Uh, there was a security conference back then when Russia adopted uh, very tough stances against the eastward expansion of NATO as well as Washington's unilateralism on the world stage. And that uh, uh, many things contributed to that position, of course. I believe that. Uh, uh, th th these developments uh, have already begun on the world stage and uh, they are being stabilized now and these developments uh, may be stabilized and I guess we are getting closer to uh, st stabilization and uh, probably we will see a multi-polar uh, world um, the, the, uh, as you see the uh, Russia's military operation in Ukraine we are witnessing that development uh, Europe and the US actually um, they, they don't have any military action on the agenda uh, at the moment, uh, any military response. And uh, Russia, of course, is a world power, and naturally, Ch and China, China is uh, is regarded as an international power because of its uh, economic and political position in the world. But Russia, in its own right, uh, enjoys military power, so it is also regarded as a major power in the world. And. In fact, in fact uh, developments uh, in Ukraine, the Ukraine crisis, is a point in time where Russia is once again uh, making its presence felt as um, an international power. Well, leading up to the recent events, the Kremlin had claimed uh, that the West broke a promise that it made back in the 1990s not to expand NATO, so uh, basically, uh, uh, they're uh, uh, laying some of uh, uh, some of the blame, some of the tensions uh, of uh, what we're seeing right now on uh, Western countries and on NATO. Uh, just moments ago, we saw the Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian stating that uh, what's taking place right now is due to NATO provocations. Uh, how do you see the role of the eastward expansion uh, of NATO uh, being a foundation of the recent tensions? Uh, that have unfolded. Well, uh, anyway, uh, differences there, uh, differences and conflicts of interest exist among major powers uh, with, re uh, with regards to NATO, and the NATO's eastward expansion could uh, was a pr uh, provocative move, which actually provoked Russia's military action. But what one point is important here? In Ukraine, we are seeing a deep chasm, uh, deep differences, uh, political differences because of the internal situation there. 
and this uh, was the major drive behind uh, the the Ukraine crisis. I mean, uh, even if Russia and the U.S. Um, uh, actually agree on uh, NATO's uh, on the prevention of NATO's eastward expansion and if US and uh, Russia actually had reached an agreement uh, like in 2015 even if they had reached an agreement still more developments would have taken place in Ukraine which would uh, uh, pit these two powers against one another the provocative issue which is here what actually what has provoked Russia and what made the provocative move which made Russia uh, call for the independence of the eastern region of Ukraine has been the deep differences, uh, identity and political differences which exist in Ukraine. And I guess one of the major contributors to them has been uh, the very policies adopted by Russia and U.S. themselves, and we saw that during the Cold War era, this is a, these have further deepened the identity political differences in Ukraine. Western Ukraine are mostly leaning toward the West, and the eastern parts of Ukraine are mostly populated by Russians and are leaning towards Russia mostly. And the identity political situation in Ukraine uh, is in such a way that there is no single uh, approach there. And any agreement which is uh, signed between Russia, Europe, and the US uh, should not only uh, be about the eastward expansion of NATO, and it, such an agreement should also include the interests of these internal groups which exist inside Ukraine, like the Minsk, uh, Minsk agreement in, tw uh, in 2015 you saw that that agreement was not implemented and the crisis in Ukraine will continue will perpetuate because and there is also an atmosphere of pessimism um, between the US and Russia with regards to the with regards to the NATO right when you mention uh, provocative actions uh, we have to uh, look at Europe's role in all of this in retrospect do you think that Europe could have uh, played a better part, could have had uh, a, uh, a bigger part in de-escalating tensions and uh, maybe uh, by dancing to the drum of the United States it took uh, a totally different path, a different initiative. Yes, of course, naturally. I believe that Europe in 2014 was one of the key factors which uh, created that crisis. You see, the uh, political differences which existed between uh, uh, the, those linked towards the Russia and the West in 2014, uh, Europe further provoked those who were leaning toward the West and uh, uh, politically supported them, so created an atmosphere of pessimism and made Russia pessimistic about Europe's uh, policies toward Ukraine. and that. Uh, and, um, after the developments in February 2014, which led to the, uh, which uh, saw the then Ukrainian president flee the country, we saw that uh, Russia uh, deployed its uh, troops in eastern Ukraine in order to uh, regain Crimea. I believe that in over the past years, maybe Europe uh, 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 somehow uh, adopted a more moderate policy toward Ukraine and uh, probably uh, Europe came to understand that uh, uh, foreign interference will not solve the Ukraine crisis but in fact uh, uh, something had been triggered and uh, that uh, fire uh, spread and went out of control and even Europe couldn't control it I believe that the wrong policies adopted by Europe in 2014 led to the crisis and further fueled the crisis and now you can see that the security of whole, of whole Europe is at stake. And there were also rounds of negotiations uh, between uh, uh, Russia on one hand, and we had NATO countries, the United States, and Europe on the other hand. Russia set forth, uh, uh, they proposed um, uh, their conditions, their security conditions, and uh, the other side, uh, namely the United States, uh, which was at the helm, uh, rejected 
all of them uh, with regards to security, with regards to the eastward expansion of NATO. Maybe this was the actual scenario that uh, the United States and the likes of, of Washington and London were following, but uh, at the end of the day, they probably bit off more that they can chew when it comes to Russia. Uh, we should draw a line between several issues. First, I believe that, uh, as I said, in 2007, the security and political positions of Russia uh, 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 led the U.S. to come to come to the conclusion that its uh, engagement with Russia will uh, uh, see Russia introduce itself as a world power and the unipolar world that was favored and w that would jeopardize the unipolar world favored by the U.S. Since then, we have seen uh, the U.S. adopt policies in order to undermine Russia. They NATO's eastward expansion, uh, the expansion of NATO, as well as, and also economic sanctions uh, which were imposed were in this line, and later on other crises emerged in order to be serve as a pretext for sanctioning Russia. And uh, uh, because the U.S. Uh, felt threatened by Russia, so it wanted to isolate Russia. Uh, let me say another point that basically uh, Russia after the situation because of the economic situation because of a good economic situation it had after a rise in oil prices uh, russia uh, supported uh, by its atomic and military power uh, russia tried to uh, make its presence felt as a world power. Well, the U.S. and Europe adopted a policy. They were trying to gradually weaken Russia. On the other hand, uh, they uh, had their own policies with regards to NATO's expansion. They were following those policies in order to step into the territory of the former Soviet Union. So, and all of them boiled down to the Ukraine crisis. And we had some other crises before that, the Georgia crisis and the uh, crises which emerged in other countries like Belar Belarus and some Eastern European countries. Uh, the Ukraine crisis was the height of those crises and uh, uh, Russia actually uh, was facing aggressive policies by the U.S. and Europe. and. Uh, before that, we saw uh, the kind of language, uh, well, Russia had more moderate language when talking to Europe. Uh, uh, Russia referred to uh, Europe and U.S. as partners, but after the Ukraine crisis worsened, Russia's language changed and referred to the U.S. and Europe uh, with uh, more aggressive ter terms. So I believe that all these points, when we piece them together, we will find out that, uh, uh, well, well uh, I believe that uh, all these things uh, will create a, a, an atmosphere of pessimism, which now exists between the Europe, US, and Russia. And as I said, a possible pact, a possible agreement uh, uh, will not mean an end to the Ukraine crisis because of the strong rivalries which have existed. The situation, I said, the domestic situation in Ukraine is even out of control. And uh, I believe that Russia is well aware of this fact, and that is why it has adopted a more aggressive policy with regards to Ukraine. All right, thanks a lot, expert in Eurasian affairs, Ms. Afife Abedi, joining us uh, from the Iranian capital, Tehran. Thank